Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. A virtual thumbs up. Great, thank you. So we'll get going here. And welcome to this morning. Hi, hi everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming this morning. My name is Melody DeLapp. I'm an administrative assistant on the Everett campus in the chancellor's office. I'm also a CUG alum, as is my husband, whose picture you will see in several of the slides today. I'm covering a lot of ground and I will be talking fast. So uh, if you feel like you missed something, I believe that this will be recorded and available at a future date. All of the URLs and publications that I'm referring to are available if you wanted to email me and request them, I'd be happy to give them to you. So my goals for today's presentation are to give you useful information, to um, give you some enjoyable images that are stress reducing, build your confidence if you're a beginning gardener or if you're an experienced gardener and to do some community building. I have 30 plus years of experience um, with organic gardening. I'm not a master gardener. Um, when I was 19, I was studying agriculture in college and then I was given an opportunity to work in a one acre seed garden for the Abundant Life Seed Foundation in a mountain valley called Stahican in the Cascades. And I jumped at the opportunity and spent two years there learning many of the principles that I'm still using today. For the uh, purpose of today's presentation, organic will mean without chemicals. Organic can be, mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but for today, um, it's just going to mean without the use of chemicals as much as possible. So from um, the time I was 19 to today, uh, I now garden in a local pea patch. My husband and I have um, almost 2,000 square feet of a uh, space. We started with a 10 by 10 foot plot. This is owned by a church and I'm fortunate to also sit on the advisory board for this garden. We live in the suburbs where we're surrounded by tall cedar trees, so we had to move into a sunnier area to do our gardening. So where do we start? We start with the dirt. Um, it's really important that you know what's going on with the dirt. Uh, just like people, plants need the right nutrition to grow big and strong. So it's important to test your soil. It's very easy to do your own soil testing. There are a lot of um, kits out on the market. Here are a couple of them. Um, in this slide. Those are jars from my kitchen counter a couple years ago that told me that my um, pH levels were all over the place. You can also send your soil out. I did a quick Google search on WSU Extension soil testing and one of the first sites to come up was the Puyallup website and I felt like they had quite a bit of information about sending your soil out for testing so I just wanted to show that with, to you here. Plants like a neutral pH, if your soil turns out to be too acidic, you want to apply lime. If it's too alkalinic, you'll have to apply elemental sulfur, and that takes a lot longer to um, adjust. So ways that you can amend your soil um, are with compost is one of them. Compost, uh, you can make your own, you can buy it by the bag, you can purchase it by the yard and have it delivered or go pick it up. But I do recommend that you make sure you know what you're getting in your compost. Some places do use human sludge, which is a little gross, but apparently it's legal by the federal mandates. Um, personally, I prefer my organic compost to have animal waste like horses or goats, vegetarian animals in it. So make sure you know what's in your compost. There's a big difference between compost and regular soil, as you can see here. Um, this is about 10 wheelbarrows full on one of our garden beds a couple of years ago. Um, it's, it's just nice and rich and it really helps your soil. You can also amend soil with fertilizer. I've used all of these. There's liquid, there's powder, there's granules. Again, organic is best. The reason is that organic fertilizer is going to feed the soil, not just the plant. Another problem with um, synthetic fertilizers is that they do run the, you will run the risk of burning your plants and you have to reapply them often, which makes them a little more expensive. A lot of times people ask, what do the numbers on the fertilizer mean? It's referring to the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, N, P, and K. So uh, 10, 10, 10 will have an equal amount of those nutrients in it. If you have uh, 20, 20, 20, again, that's equal. 20, 0, 10 means it has no phosphorus, but a lot of nitrogen and potassium. That's what those numbers mean. 
Nitrogen is good for leaf growth on a plant, things that are sprouting up. So if you have lettuce, spinach, or Swiss chard, which is what is in this picture, nitrogen is important to those plants. Phosphorus will be important to your root crops, flowers, and things like tomatoes and cucumbers. I consider those fruiting vegetables. Potassium is very important for the cell structure and growth of the plant. If your plants look sickly or off color and you um, are not sure, test your soil, a good chance that it'll be potassium deficiency. So just one more slide on the numbers and the fertilizer. Just make sure you, you find fertilizer that has the right numbers for what your plants need. Another way to amend soil is with mulch. I recommend straw mulch or leaf or grass clippings. If you're using grass clippings, don't use them after you've sprayed chemicals on your lawn to get rid of bugs. They all, mulch also helps um, keep the moisture in, but straw mulch can also be a good home for slugs, so do be aware of that. I recommend that you stay away from using hay for mulch. There are a lot of seeds in hay and you're essentially planting weeds in your garden when you use hay. Chipped bark and wood and those sorts of things, I avoid those as well because they're very acidic. Some plants like blueberries and raspberries like a little more acidic soil, but very few veggies do. So I uh, steer clear of those. One last word on soil amendment. Check your WSU Extension Office for specific ways that can help you. And here's a list of uh, their locations, a website for their locations. So why raised beds? Here are some examples of raised beds. People use stock tanks, people build their own, and some people like myself just dig a path and throw the dirt on the bed. They do warm up earlier in the spring, so that means earlier planting. The soil tends to be looser, which means the roots can grow down deep and there's better drainage and that means bigger, healthier plants. They're easy to work with. They prevent soil compaction and that just means when the dirt gets packed down and it's hard for the roots to grow in compacted soil. They're neater, they can be neater and more attractive, and you can put them where the soil might be unsuitable. You can build a garden over concrete even if you wanted to. Tips and tricks for using for raised beds is make sure they're wide enough that you can reach in the middle, but not too wide. I'm a short person, so my beds tend to be three to three and a half feet wide. When they're four to five feet wide, I can't reach the weeds in the middle and I end up having to step on the bed and that frustrates me. If you are building a bed, I recommend that you stay away from pressure treated wood, especially that was built prior to 2003. It will contain something called chromium copper arsenate. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that in my body. Use a mix of native garden soil and compost to fill your built beds with. Uh, potting soil is going to drain too quickly and um, dry out very quickly and compact very a lot. Also, if you're using the compost in the native garden soil, mix it together, don't layer it on. Leave enough space between the beds for your wheelbarrows or for you to kneel down and weed. Um, place, I recommend placing a barrier on the paths to prevent the weed growth that will come later on because the weeds will sprout and um, the seeds will go into your garden, your vegetable bed. And I also recommend that you choose your site well. Plants need a minimum of six hours of sun a day and you also wanna consider your water source. My raised beds start like this. They um, get a lot of compost thrown on them and then our daughter's boyfriend this year came and did a little rototilling. Let's see if we can get this to work. Oh, doesn't wanna work today. I had a little video there for you, sorry about that. And then we start with the paths and we just dig a path using a string to make it nice and straight. We throw the dirt onto the bed, smooth the bed, and then we are ready for planting. Sorry, just a minute, I'm having a little trouble getting my slides to progress, there we go. So some of my favorite tools, um, the upper left hand corner is a trach and I, it's in my hand all the time in the garden. It has the trowel at one end and the rake at the other. It's a very balanced tool and it's lightweight. And I, I just use it for everything. I also like having a garden bag with lots of pockets and the water resistant bottom. The trug is good for putting weeds in and carrying them to the compost pile or harvesting and putting the harvest in there. And I use plant markers all the time in my garden. I'll talk about that a little later. The garden row markers are another tool that I will always want to have. Um, Sunset named them their best tool in August of 2014, best garden tool. The URL that is listed here showed me that they're also made in Duval, so they're made in Washington, another plus. 
that they're just two dowels with a string between them, but they help us plant things in a straight row and create straight paths, and they're a very good tool. Some other things that are nice but not essential, soil thermometer. The garden rocker sits me about eight to 10 inches off the ground. It's movable, meaning I can rock back and forth. And it helps when I'm working with um, plants that are tall, like tomatoes or green beans. And then the hoary knife makes just a beautiful clean cut. So when you're ready to plant, it's best to have a plan. I start with a graph paper and I label which end is north and I also mark how wide and long it is. And then I write down what I'm going to plant where. And then when it's time to plant, I will write down the date, what the name of the plant, the specific variety. I will write down whether it was a seed or a start. Um, those are all very helpful. Um, the, the things that are in a row like beets and carrots, I just do a dotted line or a straight line. When I have um, things that will grow up as individual plants not in a row, then I use the little circles to indicate where they're going to go. And as the season progresses, I just keep, um, keep a record of it. It's also important to remember to rotate your crops every year. This helps you avoid insect infestations as well as um, plant diseases. So next year the corn will go down at the south end of the bed and everything will move one row up north. So do you want to plant seeds or starts? You definitely get more for your money when you plant seeds. It's also very satisfying. Sorry about this. This did not happen in all my practices. There we go. You also get the satisfaction of seeing them pop out of the ground. These are baby beets. Starts are good for instant gratification. They're also very good for getting a jump on the season. Heat loving crops over here on the west side of the mountains, such as squash and tomatoes. Um, if you buy a start that was started in a greenhouse in January, then you'll have an earlier harvest and probably a better harvest. Don't be discouraged if your, um, your seedlings, I started these beets on my own. Don't be discouraged if they look scraggly. I put them in the ground on April 19th. And as you can see on May 21st, they were growing big and strong. You can get the best of both worlds by starting your own seeds. You don't need fancy equipment. You can just put them in the windowsill. Um, you don't need the fancy trays, but when you run out of them, like I did this year, you can just use Tupperware to catch the water and put your seeds in those trays. I do recommend the seedling heat mats for anyone who is going to get serious about starting their own seeds. They're inexpensive. I just checked Amazon yesterday. They've gone down, they're on sale for $12.99, but they're great for keeping the seeds at a nice even temperature 24 seven, and that really helps the seeds to get started. For heat, Loving seeds like tomatoes and squash and loofah, I will put them inside a Ziploc bag and that also helps them um, just pop right up out of the ground. Once your seeds have gotten to the point where you're about ready to put them in the ground, you need to harden them off, which means moving them outside, starting at about an hour a day and then building up over a week to being outside and then overnight. The other fun part about starting your own seeds is when you see they're just about to pop out and this was this was May 13th and I noticed that they were just starting to come up every day I took a picture and um, I got to see my blue Hubbard grow. It was a lot of fun. Peat pots are what I use to plant my seeds in. They are um, nice because you don't have to traumatize the plant by taking it out of the pot. You can just put the whole thing in the ground. The roots will grow right through the sides or the bottoms. There are the hard, more hard-sided kind like the upper left or the peat pots that I use the most are the ones that you just put them in water and they spring up. This year I tried something new and I put my peas into toilet paper tubes and my sunflower seeds. And that worked very well. Um, starting on March 19th, I planted the Oregon pod sugar peas and they grew big and strong. I put them in pots on my deck, which is another way that you can garden. And here they are on the first on June 6th. And just uh, two nights ago, we had a really nice harvest of peas with our dinner. Whatever you do when you put your plants in the ground, whether they're seeds or starts, make sure you label in the garden where you put them. And that's why those garden markers are so important. Write it down on paper. And then I like to keep a photo journal. So I take a picture of everything along the way um, as I'm gardening. Companion planting is um, 
a great way to garden. You can get a lot of vegetables in the same amount of space, a lot more vegetables in the same amount of space than you ever thought possible. This is a classic lettuce, onion, and carrots. Corn, pole beans, and squash are another classic companion planting um, triad. You can also use plants to deter insects. Nasturtiums are also planted near my squash to deter the squash beetle. Uh, marigolds is the scented kind. Some of the newer varieties of marigolds do not have any scent, so they aren't going to help you as much. But marigolds work very hard in the garden to keep insects away. Even underground, their roots give off an odor that help keep the underground ickies away. I also plant onions along the borders of my beds. They also emit a strong odor that keeps insects away. Once you've planted, watering is very crucial. Um, if your seeds dry out, they will not grow. It's also crucial all season long. Plants need a minimum of two inches of water a week. And then certain plants like the ones you see here need more water as the season progresses. I do like to use uh, soaker hoses. There are a lot of reasons for that. There is little water loss to evaporation. The water can go down slow and deep into the soil. I can water anytime. I can put this on and be pulling weeds over in the tomatoes. You can um, reuse the drip components, take good care of them. You can use them year after year. The only drawback is that it is a little bit more expensive to set up initially. I do especially like how I can curl them around certain plants so I can make sure my tomatoes and peppers get a lot more water. You can use a watering wand and a hose or a sprinkler and a hose. It's a lot less expensive. It just requires a hose and a nozzle or a hose and a sprinkler. And it is uh, a little more time consuming. It often will give only superficial watering so then the roots don't grow as deep and that's not good either. Concentrated stream means significant runoff. You tend, especially as your plants get bigger, there's more evaporation because the water's landing on the leaves and not getting down to the soil. And you also have more opportunity for disease. So soaker hoses are a great way to go. Then it's time to weed. Um, Paul and I have discovered that weeding can be a zen-like experience, probably because we do it so much. We've talked ourselves into that. But you could mulch to help keep the weeds down. It makes for happy gardeners. Uh, this, of course, was straw mulch. And then this is compost mulch. Even when you do put mulch down, a few weeds will pop up. And in the compost mulch, I do find that weeds do do pop up there a little bit more than the straw mulch. This is an example. The front bed has the compost mulch in it. The other beds behind it haven't gotten any yet. A big advantage, like we talked earlier, is um, that the beds heat up earlier in the spring. However, they continue to heat up. So mulch is going to help regulate the temperature in your bed. It also regulates moisture. It'll act like a sponge in the wet weather. In the hot weather, it keeps the moisture in. And you just will find your raised beds are a lot healthier with mulch. Let's talk for a minute about insects. Beneficial insects fall into three categories. The predators, like the ladybug and the ladybug larva here, are um, big warriors against the aphid armies. Don't discount spiders. I hid him on purpose. None of us really want to look at a wolf spider, but they're very good um, in your garden. They will help with a lot of insects. The ground beetles are predatory as adults and as larvae. Pollinators are your friends. Mostly we think of bees as pollinators, but ants, flies, even mosquitoes, butterflies, those can all be pollinators. And that's another reason to go organic. You don't want to kill them off. The parasitizers will lay their eggs onto the host and then the larva will eat it, like you can see with the tomato hornworm here. So they're another way to battle. Lacewings are um, another great insect you want in your garden. The, uh, the larva will be what actually fight your insects and critters. Detrimental insects and critters fall into one category, bad. Snail traps are a great way to go for organic gardening. When, if you decide to do that, make sure you plant your beer trap below ground. That jar is filled with beer. The snails or slugs fall in and they can't get out. Sluggo is considered acceptable for organic gardening. It, it is, um, I believe it's iron phosphate and it will just biodegrade into the ground and it is not harmful to pets or people. Diatomaceous earth, I have to look at my notes because it is the fossilized remains of tiny aquatic organisms whose skeletons are made of silica. And when insects crawl over the diatomaceous earth, their, um, their skins and bodies get abrased and then they meet their demise. Aphids, I think everyone battles aphids. They come in a variety of colors. They are um, less of a problem with a healthy plant. 
So if you're in, you're having a plant that's attacked by aphids, then that plant probably is struggling. It might need water or more nutrition. There are a variety of ways to control aphids. You can purchase ladybugs by the bag full, and we do that every year, and I think that works very well in our garden. Garden. You can buy insecticidal soap. You can make your own. You can give them a blast with water from the hose, um, or you can use neem oil. And I do like to keep neem oil in my garden uh, supply because I can also use it for uh, powdery mildew, which I tend to have a lot of here over on the west, wet side of the mountains. And it also fights black spot, which is a type of fungus that we see here also. You also might have rabbits, deer, raccoons, a whole variety of living creatures or mammal type creatures. I don't have enough time to go into that here but um, they can all be a nuisance. If you're lucky, you have a friend in the garden who will help you keep them out of your garden. So now you have planned and planted and watered and weeded and checked on the insects. It's just time to let your plants grow. So here's some celery, some bok choy and tomatoes. This is a baby pumpkin, immature watermelon on the left and then a mature one on the right. Carrots, artichoke, broccoli, these are the beets that I showed a little earlier. They're doing very well as of June 10th. Zucchini, more tomatoes, sunflowers, more tomatoes. I grow a lot of tomatoes. Um, in this picture, in the center is garlic. There's some celery and some broccoli and then tomatillos on the right. Immature pumpkin just starting to turn orange. And of course, some yellow squash. These are cucumbers and more celery. This is a cantaloupe on the right. And these are flowers, zinnias on the left. We do grow hops. My husband brews his own beer. The lower left are cherry tomatoes, a variety called blue indigo. Those are baby acorn squash on the bottom right and green bean flowers on the top right. There's an old adage that you want your corn knee high by the 4th of July. And I do feel that's very true. If you get your corn that high, plant it early enough and get it to grow that tall, you'll have a good crop. This is a variety of Atlantic dill pumpkin. They grow quite large. They can be 100 pounds. So I'll talk for a minute about structural support. If you're fortunate enough to be married to a retired scoutmaster, he'll lash together poles for you, for your um, peas for supports. I also like to use, um, I call these my bean towers. They're obelisks and they are about eight feet tall and the pole beans like to grow up them. Picture on the left is at the beginning of the season, of course, and the picture on the right was taken mid-August. And here's just another picture of the obelisks at the base. I also use garden ladders. I bought these at Fred Meyer. I think you can find them just about anywhere. I use them for all anything that needs support, cucumbers, tomatoes, peas, baby pumpkins, uh, Jack B. Little pumpkins. They're very versatile. I use the hoops and the floating row covers for when I need to protect crops from the weather or from insects, or I just want to keep them warm in the spring. For tomatoes, we make our own tomato cages. I find these are easier to work with. I can get to the tomatoes uh, more easily. Here's an example of on the left, um, I like to trim the tomatoes and keep all that the leaves off of the ground, and then I just um, espalier them up the, the support. Uh, I find I have a much better crop if the leaves are not on the ground because they tend to get diseased and that, help, that plant suffers. Um, the hop supports are 14 feet tall. So this was May 13th, here's June 10th, so they, the hops grow very fast. Some other alternative solutions to garden problems. Uh, I do like to grow melons. That's hard to do on the side of the mountains, uh, so I have to give them a little help in the spring and I cover them with a cloche, but it's mine's the cheap variety. I just use a gallon milk jug, cut off the bottom. And as you can see, I can also take the lid off. That's what this picture is. Um, if it's a super hot day, but I don't want to take the cloche off completely, I can just open the top and let a little um, heat out. You can also get five gallon vegetable oil containers from local restaurants. Sometimes when the plants get larger and I, I need to cloche them, I use those too. So it's time for harvest. That's the reason we're doing all this right, not just for the fresh air, exercise, sunshine, wind and rain and weeds. So when it's time to harvest, you can harvest your vegetables when you want to harvest them. You can look and see when they should be ready, but if you like them nice and tender like we do, harvest them when they're young. We have a lot of, whoops, sorry, a lot of things in our garden. These are uh, zucchini and cucumbers, tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. We had a lot of broccoli last year. 
These are Anaheim peppers. A lot of squash. This is a Turk's turban. It's more of a decorative squash. These are delicata. Acorn, this is a blue Hubbard on the right. And then I love growing Cinderella pumpkins because they're quite beautiful and I use them for decoration. We grow butternut squash, that's our favorite. And then these are the Jackby little pumpkins. Um, they're a lot of fun and they're very prolific. So the Atlantic dill pumpkin grew very big. It was almost ready to harvest on the right. That's a five pound watermelon um, for size comparison. We hauled it to our front yard and they were each about 100 pounds. The hops at harvest time, sunflowers. Artichoke grow very well on the west side. I'm surprised they come back year after year. That was a, a new one on me. So they're a lot of fun to have around. And it's just um, growing your own vegetables is very rewarding and it's become very popular in the last few months as I'm sure many of you have noticed. Here is one of my favorite varieties of tomato. I just wanted to share this picture because I thought it was such a cool comparison to the quarter. Black crims are heirloom and very tasty. So we can't possibly eat all of the food, especially when the harvest is on in August and September. We share with family and friends in our food bank or we preserve. Last year we made tomato juice and this is just a progression of how that went. And the tomato juice was delicious, <clears throat> both for breakfast and Bloody Marys. We make our own salsa. Um, we also had a bumper crop of tomatillos last year. So I tried my hand at Salsa Verde and it was delicious. I got five quarts and it was gone by January. So at the end of the year, at the end of fall, you wanna put your garden to bed for the winter. That's another important step in a healthy garden. You will want to remove any annuals and harvest any seeds that you want to keep. Get rid of as many weeds as you can. Collect leaves and yard debris for your compost pile. Um, you can put compost onto the garden even if it's a little bit hot. It has the whole winter to cool down. You can plant a cover crop or you can mulch with straw and leaves after the ground freezes. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can put plastic on your garden. It's not really considered organic. For, for our gardens, it's the most economical way to protect and keep the soil from gathering too many weeds. Um, I take very good care. I use the plastic year after year, which helps my guilt about using it. Burlap bags are another way that you can cover. Um, it's a much more organic way of protecting your garden. Some things that I've learned over the years, uh, something doesn't work, pull it up and plant something else. It's, it's, uh, it's nothing's planted in concrete. If all of the plants in your bed are not growing and you have not tested your soil yet, now's the time to do that and find out what's going on. Use those plant markers wherever you plant something, especially in the early spring. Um, when I plant my broccoli seed and other things, those tend to look just like the weeds when they pop up. So if I've planted three broccoli seeds right by the white marker, then I know those aren't weeds and I'm not going to pull them. Talk to other gardeners, ask them questions, and other gardeners are gonna learn from you as well as you learning from them. Wear your gloves often, but take them off every now and then and actually get your hands dirty, it's good for you. Use sunscreen, wear a hat, and be sure to show your caring nature by sharing with your food bank and friends and family. Some of my favorite online places to purchase gardening supplies is gardeners.com, it's an employee owned company. They have great tools and a lot of sales. Plow and Hearth is a little pricey, but I love a lot of their products. Facebook has many wonderful gardening groups and people there are very friendly and willing to um, share information with you. Some really great publications. Um, the top three are from our extension offices around the state. And then of course at the bottom, How to Grow More Vegetables by John Jeevans is um, a great book. I used it back in the seed garden in when I was 19 and it for many years has been my gardening Bible. Here's another um, email, here's my email address. And I'm gonna put in another plug for the Master Gardener program. I'm not a Master Gardener. I hope to be one when I grow up someday, but it is a great program, the best in all the land and I highly recommend them. Remember there are no mistakes, only experiments. And I wish you happy gardening. And if you wanna learn about growing dahlias, I will be here on June 25th to share a bit about them. That presentation will not be as long as this one but I would be happy to share that with you as well. Thanks everyone.